Hello and welcome to The Chrissy B Show. Now more than ever, people, especially youngsters, are self-harming. Now you might think that they're seeking attention. You're right, they're crying out for help. Now people who self-harm are in extreme emotional distress, often stemming from low self-worth, which could be brought on by all sorts of reasons. Maybe bullying, maybe something that's happened in the family, it could be anything. And they actually feel that hurting themselves is the only way they can cope. Now, according to the Royal College of Psychiatrists, one in 10 people self-harm by taking tablets, cutting, burning, piercing, or swallowing objects. They say it's more common in young people, women, gay and bisexual people, and in some subcultures. And some people self-harm regularly, and it can become an addiction. So we're gonna be tackling this very sensitive topic today. I'll be speaking to Charlotte O'Reilly, who has self-harmed, and psychologist Hamira Riaz, She'll be here to tell us how it can be treated. And we'll also be speaking to Jessica Cotton of The Right Here Project and the work that they're doing to support young self-harmers. But let's start now with the story of a very brave young lady to talk about it, and that's Charlotte O'Reilly. Hello, Charlotte. Hi. Thank you so much for coming on. Now, we did have a little chat in the green room earlier. And like I said, I think you're, you're very brave to come on and talk about this. But it's also very important that we, we do speak about it. Why is, that, is it so important for you to talk about it today because it's a horrible horrible thing to go through and it's not just yourself that you're hurt and you're hurting so many people around you and mm. more people need to be aware that it's an actual illness it's not something that people are doing for attention mm -hmm. and it's yeah yeah it's definitely something that, that needs to be addressed isn't it yeah. now, is this the first time you're speaking about it on tv yes okay yeah. so i know you're a little bit nervous but <laughs> don't am. worry because you know the reason the reason we are doing this show is exactly the reason that it's, it's not talked about much especially on tv and i think the the less it's talked about the more people are going to feel isolated who are going through issues so this is to this show is dedicated to you at home that may be going through this problem or family members and to show you that you're not alone and there is help for you. It's not, you're not sort of weird or different just because you're going through this problem. It's a problem, lots of people go through problems, different kinds of problems, but there's always help for you. So Charlotte, let's go to your story. Can you tell us where it, where it all began, first of all? I just turned 13 and um, my dad committed suicide. Mm -hmm. and what was your relationship like with your dad before that? We were really close. Okay. He had come to me, talked to me about like all sorts of problems he had, even though he knew I didn't really understand what was going on. Mm -hmm. He'd still, it was almost as like he had no one else to talk to, so he came to me. Okay. Um, it was nice, it was really nice. Mm -hmm. And he has, he has other children as well, I was his oldest. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he adored them, he really did. So, he, yeah, he died January 31st. Mm. Um, How long ago was this? It was nine years ago. Nine years ago, yeah. okay. Yeah. But that obviously affected you really, it hit you like a... Boy. Well, at first, nobody would tell me what he'd actually done. Um, mm. He just told me he fell asleep and then I found out and I thought it was my fault because I thought... Really? Yeah. I just thought I should have been there. I w him and my mum were separated, they weren't living together. So mm -hmm. I thought, well, maybe if I'd lived with him instead of living with my mum, then I could have stopped him from doing it. He would have been happier and he wouldn't have got so down. Mm -hmm. um, but you, 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 did, you do know afterwards that it wasn't I do know now, okay. yeah. <laughs> it took me a while to... Say, to but I mean, I, I can understand the, you know, thinking that way because yeah. it's like you, you kind of... It, Anything that happens to a family member of ours, there's always lots of guilt that comes with anyone, yeah. isn't it? You think, oh, what, what if this happened? What if I was there more? And you have all these, like, what ifs, but at the end of the day, it's not anyone's fault. No, no. Yeah. It did take me a long time to realise that, but mm. I know now. So what was he going through issues himself, obviously? I he had suffered depression years. For years, right? Yeah, since I was, like, really small. Mm. And... He was getting help about two weeks before he died. He'd been referred to a mental health team to try and put him on tablets. I think he did get put on a tablet, mm -hmm. um, like antidepressants, and to try and get some therapy of some sort. Yeah. And he was on a waiting list. The waiting list was roughly about 10 weeks. And it was, it was too much of a wait. It was too long. Mm -hmm. And he didn't make it. 
So after that happened, Charlotte, how did that affect you? Obviously, you feeling guilty and blaming yourself. What, what did that oh. le lead to? A lot of anger. As mm -hmm. I was arguing with most people around me, I got into an argument with my cousin. And as we were talking, well, as we were arguing, I just started scratching myself without, I wasn't thinking about it, I just did it. In your arms? Yeah. yeah. And then after I'd done it, I saw it and I thought, well, that felt good, that calmed me down a lot. So every time I was feeling angry and I just, I didn't know how to let it out, I'd, I'd cut. Mm. Or I'd scratch and it just. It say cut, me. would you use like. But I'd scratch or? it first, mm -hmm. so it's just my nails, which was really bad, it got infected a lot. Um, and then it moved to razors and I'd use razors to cut. Did you tell anyone about this that you're doing it or did, were you. For the first couple of months, I never. I did hide it. Okay. I was. I was petrified that I was going to get told off. Um, my mum was going to say I was doing it for attention. She was going to be disappointed in me and I, I didn't want to put any more hurt onto her, especially after my dad. Mm -hmm. So I hid it, I'd wear long sleeve tops. Yeah. And then one day my auntie just, she, she knew that I wasn't myself. So she asked me what was going on and I told her and she convinced me to tell my mum. Mm -hmm. And my mum was really supportive about it. She, she was brilliant, she got me through most of it. So this is a very important point that you're, you're making here, Charlotte, because people need to feel that they can talk. Yeah. So for family members, you know, you, you really have to kind of be careful what you say and don't judge the person because, Definitely. you know, mental health issues are so difficult to open up about anyway. It is, so yeah. you have to kind of be prepared and know how to help the person and actually at the end towards the end of the show we're going to be giving some advice as well to family members and friends yeah. on how to react what you can do to help those that are going through this problem yeah sorry continue. i think the best thing my mum did to for me like when she found out was just sat me down and said right we're going to get your help yeah um, did you feel kind of a bit of relief then like, like yeah. okay someone <laughs> yeah. understands me or I at was, least is trying to get help me well, I was relieved that someone finally knew about it, like okay. my mum finally knew about it mm -hmm. and I wasn't having to hide it from her anymore. So I was yeah. locking myself in my bedroom, I didn't want to be around anybody. Mm -hmm. I just isolated myself from my friends as well. And How often did you used to do it? Pretty much every day. Really? Yeah, it did become an addiction. Okay. And it was extremely hard to break out of, very hard. What was, did it progress to anything else, or was it mainly the, the scratching and the, and the cutting? No, it progressed to burning. Um, if I was getting ready for school, mm -hmm. um, I, couldn't, I didn't have access to razors then. My mum had taken all that sort of stuff away, so I couldn't, I couldn't do it. She was trying to stop me. Mm -hmm. So I had my straighteners, and I'd burn with them when I was getting ready for school most times. Mm -hmm. And she never, she thought I was getting ready, so I'd just, I'd just do it quickly. Okay. It was like, it got past the point of needing to have a reason. I so just, just got I into the habit it. of doing yeah. it kind of thing. It was just like, oh, I need, I need to feel it. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like, I wasn't angry, I just wanted to feel what, mm -hmm. well, the feeling it gave me. For people that are watching now that don't understand, you know the reason behind it and I'm thinking look why would anyone do that to themselves what mm -hmm. can you can you just explain what would go on in your head and how it was how you were feeling at the time how you're feeling like it was actually helping you because that's what yeah that's what people think that do self-harm it's like it's the only way I know how to cope can you just talk us through it yeah it's when I was angry I felt like this pressure inside my body my whole body was it felt like if it didn't do something, it was going to explode. Right. Um, and the only way I could get this pressure out of my body was to cut and release it out. Okay. Uh, it's like, do you know when you're really angry and you just want to hit something? Mm -hmm. It's like that. But you cut and you need to see it. You need to physically see it. And then you feel see. relief yeah, afterwards. Not for long. Probably okay. for five, ten minutes. And then guilt will kick in. Guilt of what you've done to yourself? Yeah and okay. how people are going to react around me. And what about the pain that you'd actually feel from the, from the hurt? I didn't feel it. Not even afterwards? Afterwards or? I did, yeah. While yeah. I was doing it, I didn't feel it. It was... Really? It wow. didn't hurt. It was... It was a good feeling because it was release. Mm -hmm. 
and I couldn't feel the pain until afterwards and it stung, it was horrible, it really stung. Um, and there's a lot of after treatment you need to do with it as well. Yeah. Okay. Now, Charlotte, we're going to go to a break shortly, but after the break, I'd like you to tell the viewers the worst thing that you did, because you, you were telling me about that in, in the yeah. green room. Yeah. But also, um, viewers at home, we're going to also see how she got help as well and, you know, the things that you're doing today. But also, we're going to be having a, a specialist coming on, Hamira Riaz who specialises in this area and she's going to be giving some help, explaining sort of some of the things that go through someone's mind when they're, when they're doing this. And to get help for you guys as well that are going through it as well because there is light at the end of the tunnel definitely and it's not all doom and gloom, is it? No. We can move on from it. Definitely moved on from it now. Yeah, okay then. Alright, so do join us after this. Don't forget to subscribe to The Chrissy B Show. Always aiming to show you the happier side of life. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back to the show. So today we're talking about self-harm and we have a very brave young lady, Charlotte O'Reilly, who's telling us her story. Now before we continue with her story, let's take a look at this video of some of the thoughts that people who self-harm have. Okay, so let's now go back to Charlotte's story. So Charlotte, you've told us quite a bit already, but you, you were telling me earlier that it did get a lot worse. It did, yeah. When I was 16, my mum got me hospitali hospitalised because mm. um, I started trying to commit suicide. I was seeing things, hearing things that were telling me to cut and telling me to hurt myself, that I didn't deserve to be here. Um, Did you say things? Or what was it you were... I saw actually seen physical. Yeah, I saw a man, and he was dressed as a butcher, um, mm -hmm. and he he would tell me that if I didn't hurt myself, he'd hurt me a lot worse than I ever could. If that makes was sense. this when you were by yourself, or were there other people around at this? It was mainly stage? when I was by myself, okay. but I didn't want that to must be. Must have been really frightening. Yeah, I didn't mm -hmm. want to be around other people, so I sort yeah. of made it worse myself, but. I just, I couldn't do it. I pushed everybody away from me in school. Mm. I pushed my family away from me. I pushed my friends away from me. So I was literally on my own. My mum was the only person there that would really support me. Mm. Um, so I was hospitalised for four weeks. And that it was brilliant. It was really, it was helpful. To um, be, to be hospitalised? Yeah, yeah. Why why do you say that? Because most people feel like, oh my God, I don't want to like... It's scary, the thought of being in there, um, but you've got somebody to talk to 24-7 that mm -hmm. will fully listen to you and help you as much as they can. Mm -hmm. They really, and there's people in there as well for the same reasons as I was. Mm -hmm. And it was comforting knowing that I wasn't the only one going through it. Yeah. So I got out for about a month, two months and had to go back in for two weeks. Did you try again? Yeah, to... yeah, I tried again. Mm -hmm. How many times did you try altogether? Oof, I couldn't tell you, yeah, really. Couldn't, it was 
countless times. Now, when, when you say, you know, when you were trying to, to kill yourself, was it because you thought, look, there's no way I'm going to get over this and I don't, I'm not going to get help? What, what was the reason? There was several reasons. One reason, it wasn't to kill myself. It was to get rid of the pain. Like, a few paracetamol wouldn't do it, so I'd just take two, two, three boxes of paracetamol. Um, the pain think. of having hurt yourself, you mean? No, or just, or pain just the, the emotional it pain? Just hurt. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like the tightening in your stomach, the anxiety, you just really hurt. But this is, this is a thing because when, when people do uh, kill themselves, it's not that they didn't want to live anymore, it's, they don't just, they, it's just that they don't want to live with the pain yeah. that they're going through. So it's not that, you know, they hate life, they just don't want to deal with what's going on in their life at, yeah, at the time. Yeah, they don't to make so the pain So it's not that, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another reason was because I couldn't see a way out. I thought I was going to be like this forever. Mm -hmm. I thought about my future and it was blank. It was, I thought I wasn't clever enough to do something good with my life. I thought, well, I've pushed all my friends away. I've got nobody now. Nobody mm -hmm. will really care. I've upset my mum too much. I'm hurting her every day. So it'll be better for her if I'm just gone. Which is not the case. No, right? not at all. Let, yes, no. Yeah, let, let's make that, you know, for, for people that are watching that. These are the kind of thoughts. The people, thoughts are, yeah. you know, people are going to be better off without me. I'm causing so much trouble. I'm causing so much worry. So they'll be better off without me. Trust me. They're not going to feel better when you're not around. Not at all. They, no. they will not. They'll feel worse. So, so don't, if that thought is coming to you, you are loved by your family. You are loved by your friends. And trust me, they're going to feel a lot worse if, if you're not around. So yeah, it it's, broke it's my good mom's to mention heart it. Hearing that me say that to her yeah there was times there was a time where I told her to just end it for me and get it over and done with really yeah Gosh. that was at my worst point mm -hmm. um I moved out with my mum's when I was 18 and moved in with a ex-boyfriend who was very controlling um just say he played on the fact that you were vulnerable yeah yeah, yeah. he'd hurt me um physically and mentally um and one day it all got too much. I ran into the kitchen and I went to cut. And because I was doing it so quick and because when I did cut, I couldn't really feel the pain. I did mm. it too deep. And did it too deep? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I cut through my muscle. Oh, gosh. Um, I had to go to the hospital and they told me I was lucky that I could still use my hand because I, I was really close to cutting through like tendons and whatnot. Mm. Um, so I had to have stitches inside my arm, outside my arm, and I've still not got my feeling back. Really? I've damaged, which, which arm? It's this arm. Okay. I've, um, I still can't feel the bottom half of my arm, mm -hmm. so the nerve damage. So it's like, you feel like you're in control, but really, it's so easy to go wrong. In all of this, Charlotte, what was the the hardest thing that you you felt you had to deal with? What was the, the most difficult, difficult thing? Was it sort of hurting family or...? It was my mum, yeah. Yeah, okay. It was... It's still had... It's got an effect on her now. She's... She now suffers anxiety. Mm -hmm. Every time I have problems, I get upset or whatever, she panics thinking I'm going to do it again. Yeah. She's constantly on edge with me. And even though I know I'm not, she doesn't. Mm -hmm. And so, mum, isn't it? She's she's one of the Yeah, about she's girl. yeah. She just yeah. it's had a long term effect on her. Mm -hmm. It's had a long term effect on my friends. I'm friends with them again now, um, but they worry about me constantly, mm -hmm. yeah. and they feel they kind of tiptoe around me, worry about what to say around me still, and mm -hmm. it has affected our friendships. Got to live with it now. <laughs> um, but are you glad they know, though? Like, I'm glad, yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah. They it's are. better than sort of hiding it and... Yeah, even yeah. though they do... They do try and be careful around me. They're supportive. They're just scared of upsetting me. Because mm -hmm. they care about me a lot. And I know that now. I didn't, I didn't think they did, but yeah. I do now. But does that kind of make you like, oh, God, I'll just be normal with me? Or you, know, you don't want to kind of want people tiptoeing around you? Or do you appreciate that they're... I think it's nice. Kind of trying. <laughs> I do think it's lovely often, but I would, I do wish to be normal. <laughs> yeah. 
so you can tell them right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's been normal, we're on fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, Charlotte, so we're going to, after the break, we're, like I said earlier, we do have an expert on that specialises in, in this condition. Mm -hmm. And she's going to be giving some advice, telling us, you know, the reasons behind it and what people can actually do to get help. And also later on, we'll be speaking um, about what family members can do as well. So do join us after this. Don't forget to subscribe to The Chrissy B Show, always aiming to show you the happier side of life. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back to today's programme and we are speaking about self-harm today and joining us on the sofa is psychologist Hamira Riaz who specialises in this subject. Hello Hamira. Hi. <laughs> Welcome back. You've been on Thank the show you so before. much. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> so I know you've got a lot to say on, on this subject. Mm. Um, can I just ask you, why have you chosen to specialise in this, in this field in particular? Um, well I specialise in, a, in, a, in a, a whole bunch of things but mm. usually it's about psychological distress right, okay. and, and how that can show up and self-harm is one of the ways in which people show psychological distress. Right, okay. And what did you think of everything that um, Charlotte's spoken about today? So I think, I think incredibly brave mm -hmm. and also very eloquent. I think you found a way of really getting it across, the complexity of it across and also the fact that it progresses. And, mm. and so I think that that's probably something we want to talk about. Okay. So let's just go through sort of if you can give us the, the, sure. the, the professional definition of, of self-harm and uh, why people do it in the first place. So literally, it's, it's doing injury to oneself. And it's often due to something psychological going on underneath that the person mm -hmm. doesn't understand or can't cope with. And it's a wide spectrum of, of behaviours. It can be anything from scratching, um, biting, cutting, pulling hair, mm -hmm. swallowing things. And then it can go towards the, the, the very serious end, which is substance abuse, taking unusual personal risks, um, eating disorders and yeah. repeated attempts at overdose. Mm -hmm. Now it's important to mention here because um, I know there's this perception that people who, who do this thing, oh they're just crazy, only crazy people will do that to themselves. But it's, it's, it's something that goes so deep because I remember I was telling you both earlier in the green room that when, when I was depressed, I remember one day I was there, I was actually on a secluded beach all to myself, ideal location, I should have been really happy but I was really, really depressed and I remember sort of just, just looking up and I just started screaming, it was like why me, why am I going through this, I ran into the water, I don't know what I was trying to do but I started swimming out into mm. the deep and I, I just remember sort of shouting out, give me, I don't know who I was talking to at the time but just give me a physical pain or something that I can actually treat rather than this emotional pain that I'm feeling because I, I felt like I couldn't deal with it and I don't know what to do. And I would have preferred to have um, a disease of some description that I could take medication mm. for than what I was feeling inside. And I wasn't crazy, I was just going through problems. And that's what, that's what, that's what people need to understand, that people that do these things, it's not because they're mad, they're crazy, they're only crazy people do that to themselves. It's, a, it's an issue that they're going through that anyone actually can, can go through at absolutely, some point. Absolutely right. I mean, I, I think the causes are multiple and complex, mm -hmm. but I think they fall into four broad categories. And again, Charlotte's touched on most of them, but it's worthwhile just thinking about them quite clearly. Mm -hmm. One is about release and expression. Yeah. You, there's no other way of dealing with what's going on inside. So it's a way of expressing. It's a way of showing what's going on mm -hmm. uh, to yourself as much as to anybody else. It's just signaling that something is out of control. Mm -hmm. um, there can be a self-punishment aspect to it. Um, a sense of being bad or a sense of um, not being deserving and ashamed of something and especially she was feeling guilty actually. yeah sure, there was yeah. there was guilt involved but people who've been abused it can be mm -hmm. about harboring a secret that you can't talk about okay. and so there's self-punishment involved I brought it on myself and so it's just adding to that punishment yeah. um, it can also be and, and again you talked about it uh, uh, something that allows you to control it control something in your life. When everything else feels out of control, mm. out of your hands, you can plan the self-harm, you then do the self-harm, and then you can okay. treat the self-harm. And that allows someone to actually control things. Mm. Um, and then finally, and again, especially when uh, it's the result of some kind of bereavement that leaves you numb, 
because you can't feel anything, it's a way of feeling something. And that might sound really strange. And, and one of the myths about self-harm is that actually people like pain. They don't. It's because they're not feeling anything at all. Mm. And they don't want to feel numb anymore. So they're cutting or they're doing something to themselves in order to feel emotion, even if it's just negative emotion. Yeah. Okay, Definitely. that's quite interesting because I, I was thinking it's mainly to sort of, sort of get rid of the emotional pain, but it even can but go the also, other side. But yeah. also to have, feel something if you're not feeling anything. Well, Charlotte was saying earlier, I, I, just, I didn't feel the pain. I didn't feel it mm. at the time I was doing it, which would suggest that at the time she was doing it, she was actually numb and she was trying to yeah, feel something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what, what treatment is available? What can, what can people do? Because obviously they're not alone. It's no. important to mention now on, on this programme, no. there is help. Absolutely. There's so many things that, um, that people can do, but I think, I think it's important to think also about the reasons why people don't go for help. And okay. Because you've got to deal with that yourself or find mm. some way of dealing with it before you actually get the right help. Um, and again, it's all the negative emotions. The really ironic thing about self-harm is this. People start to do it, they come upon it sometimes accidentally, just by scratching themselves when they're feeling bad. It's just an accidental discovery that it makes you feel good. And for a temporary period, it does make you feel good. But mm. actually, it's really temporary. Yeah. Um, like you were so saying, you said it loosely lasts for 10, 10 minutes. minutes. Yes, yeah. Yeah. exactly. And then what people find is that whilst the initial injuries might heal up, no scars, they heal up quite quickly, especially if you're young, over time they accumulate. And mm -hmm. so um, you do start to get permanent scarring. And, um, and then the effect of it diminishes, so you have to do more and more. And you were talking about escalating yeah. from mm -hmm. going from one thing to another because it just wasn't, it wasn't giving you the same effect and the, the same sense of release. So as it starts to escalate, it becomes something that you find is out of your control. It mm -hmm. started out being something you could control and something and simple and straightforward, and then it takes over and it becomes compulsive. You have to do it. And it becomes a habit, an addiction, mm -hmm. and then it controls you. And then, because it's taken over your life, there's more hiding, there's more shame, there's more secrecy. The very thing that started to make you feel good at the beginning is now, ironically, the thing that's right. starting to make okay. you feel even worse about yourself. So there's a vicious cycle involved mm -hmm. and you can't stop, you're trapped. So I think all of that that people need to remember, when it first starts, it's not going to stay that way unless you get some treatment. So it's really important to try and catch it early mm -hmm. because it will just escalate otherwise. Once you've recognised something is not right, then I think the thing to do is to find somebody to confide in. Now, you could argue people wouldn't be self-harming if they had somebody obvious that they could confide in, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I think there's something about you have to share this stuff. The reason why it's all bottling up inside is because there's stuff you haven't shared and wow. you can't deal with it. Mm -hmm. You need somebody, and this is where the choice of who you turn to is really important. You need somebody who you feel accepts you somebody who respects you and somebody that's going to um, have a, an element of objectivity, not right. sort of d respond with negative emotions of their own. Mm -hmm. um, because that can, that can actually be quite off-putting when somebody responds really strongly to what you're saying. You actually need somebody who is empathetic but can, can be can objective. And hold it together as well. And hold yeah. it together <laughs> and, and, yeah. and be able to think about it dispassionately. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, if, you have, if you take all of those things into account, it might not necessarily be <laughs> your closest yeah. friend or your yeah. closest family member, especially mm. parents, um, who are likely to over-respond. Um, so it might be a, it was interesting you talked about your aunt yeah. as being the person that you turn to. That's quite typical. A friend, yeah. a teacher, a religious leader, a counsellor, um, somebody that you just think, they, it, it's going to be a safe space for me mm. to just say something. Yeah. There's a couple of things you need to remember when you start to have that first conversation. Do it on your terms. Have a sense of what you want to share and what you don't want to share. Make sure there's some boundaries around it that you feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. You may not feel comfortable with a face-to-face -face conversation to begin with. So you might want to write something down or email it or do so it over I the phone. I wrote a long letter and gave it to someone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But you also need to prepare the person for it mm -hmm. because they then, they, they are, they do feel a sense of responsibility. Once somebody has told you a secret, and yeah. I mean, all of yeah. us have been recipients of secrets, mm -hmm. as soon as somebody tells you something like that, you feel a sense of responsibility. Yeah. Um, so you need to prepare someone for the fact that they're going to be taking this responsibility. You might want to give them some time to process it. And also accept the fact that they may, at the end of the day, not feel equipped to deal with it. Mm -hmm. It might feel too big. Yeah. 
And that's not something horrible and terrible. That's just something pretty normal. It's, it's good if they're honest with you and you're honest yeah. with them, that it's too big a problem for you to deal with in the context of that relationship. You were lucky with your aunt yes. um, that she felt that she could handle it. But some people might, might be completely overwhelmed themselves mm -hmm. and might not be the best source of support. Um, and I think the other piece is trying to, well, control is an element here, you know, it's, it's the lack of control over the emotions that causes the thing in the first place. So finding some way of control mm -hmm. through journaling and actually thinking about the patterns it, it will help you to make sense of your thoughts and organise them in a way that will make sense to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So I think there's probably three buckets of thoughts that I would ask people to think about. One is um, the actual feelings themselves and finding patterns in them. There will be good days and there will be bad days. Yeah. Trying to understand what a good day is, what a bad day is, what causes a good day, mm. what causes a bad day mm. is important. Then there's the cause, you know, what's at the root of all of this? Exactly. What's tipped yeah, yeah. you over the edge? What's made it all feel uncontrollable? Because people that, concentrate on the harming itself when yeah. there is, there's a reason behind it. You have to kind the of harm, trace back and exactly. see Exactly. The harm is the symptom. Yeah. It's the symptom that something's not right. Mm -hmm. So actually, eventually, you have to get to the bottom of it all. It can be abuse. It can be bullying. It can be not living up to expectations at school. Mm. It can. And it's not just the myth is that it's about teenagers and you know it often is but it's just as often older anyone. adults mm -hmm. who've lost their job in the middle of a divorce um, you know there's some kind of um, issue in their closest relationships yeah. mental health problems creeping in elderly parents to look after it can be anything that makes you feel like you can't control your life mm. anymore so I think it's really important to look at the root cause at some point, but be careful about who you disclose to so that it always feels safe. Okay. Hey Marie, you've got one more point, haven't you? Just to make. one more. We just need to go to a quick break, and I promise after this break, Humira is going to continue. We've also got someone else that we're going to be speaking to, Jessica Cotton from the Right Here Project. So don't go away. Don't forget to subscribe to The Chrissy B Show always aiming to show you the happier side of life. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back everyone. Now just before I speak to Jessica Cotton, let's just finish off with the, the point that Hamira was making before the break. Can you just tell us the the other thing that you were going to speak about, Hamira? So I think once you've thought about the patterns that lie behind the self-harm behaviour and the triggers for it, mm. the important thing is to think about substitute ways of coping, because that's what self-harm is, it's right. a coping mechanism. So you have to okay. start getting creative about ways of coping that doesn't involve self-harm. Okay, so Hamira, thank you very much. We're going to come back to both of you in just a moment. But now we're going to go to a Skype call with Jessica Cotton from the Right Here Project in Brighton and Hove. Hello, Jessica. Hello, hi. Hi, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm good, thank you. So it's good to have you on the show. So we are tackling a, a difficult topic that most people don't like to speak about, but it's one that does need to be addressed. And you are helping people with the, with the Right Here project. Can you tell us about it and how it started? Yes. And so Right Here is a young person's mental health and wellbeing project run by YMCA Downs Link Group. And we work with young people in all sorts of ways. And this ranges from delivering youth friendly activities to support young people's emotional resilience mm -hmm. and carrying out research for young people around their experiences of health care. Okay. We are a youth participation project, which means that we're all about supporting young people to have a voice and a say in the care and support that they receive when it comes to their mental health. And we've got teams of young people working as volunteers who help us design and deliver our work, and this ensures that we stay kind of young person focused. Um, right here is really active in tackling mental health stigma and, uh, and we create user-friendly, jargon-free uh, resources to support young people who may be experiencing concerns around their mental health. Mm -hmm. but we know it's, it's also not just about um, supporting young people directly, um, because it, it's actually the responses of people around the young person experiencing stigma yeah. that's mostly really important, particularly when it comes to kind of promoting the more positive, health-seeking behaviours. Um, so we kind of create resources to help support parents um, and families to encourage them to talk more openly about mental health and about self-harm and also to other professionals like GPs, 
and um, other youth services to help them better understand the needs of young people. And the importance of really creating user friendly and um, youth friendly services as well. Okay. And what kind of an impact has, has the project made in your community there? Well, we. Uh, you know, we support young people in a number of, of, of different ways and um, one of the things that we, we've had a really good impact with is um, going out into, into various youth settings across the South East and delivering kind of universal workshops around how to cope better with sun stress and understanding how harm and, and mental health awareness. Okay, that's and, great. Yeah. Okay, that's wonderful. Jessica, thank you so much and all the best with your wonderful project. It's great to hear that you're doing something. Thank you. All right, see you. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go back over to Hamira and Charlotte over here. So it's great to hear another, you know, organisation that's helping, helping people. But like you said, it's not just youngsters, but there is help also for, for older people. So we're now going to go through some, we have some um, details here. Now this is from, let me just get this, the Royal College of Psychiatrists. And they've given some points on what you can do to help someone um, that self harms if it's a family member or a friend of yours. So, Homer, you can help me out with this. Okay, and, and you, Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, the first thing, these are some do's, first of all. So, first of all, listen to them without being critical. Now, naturally, if you are a family member, of course you're going to get emotional, you're going to feel bad. Oh, my baby, you know, I, I, you want to protect that person. But it's really, like you were saying earlier, it's important that you don't lose it and you try to keep calm and if and then you might need to support yourself as well at the end mm. of the day if you are going to be dealing with that um it says to try to understand their feelings and then move the conversation to other things and also take the mystery out of self-harm by helping them find out about self-harm on the internet or at the library now i suppose this one is so they don't feel they can actually see that it is a condition that can be treated so that they don't feel like they're, they're, they're all by themselves. Feel free to jump in, girls, if you want to say anything. Um, I'd say um, I'd be careful at that point because mm -hmm. of the amount of... Uh, Stuff that's out there. Yeah, on social media, there's things where people are encouraging others mm. to self-harm and mm, comparing that's a good it. Point. So I'd, mm. I would be careful at that one. Yeah, okay, good point. <laughs> See, guys, you need to put that on your website too, okay? <laughs> um, help them to think about their self-harm not as a shameful secret, but as a problem to be sorted out. So, you know, it, it does feel worse when it's kept inside and you, the person does feel ashamed about it, but to make them see that it's nothing to be ashamed of, it's just something that needs to be treated. And it says that if you're caring for someone who self-harms, and you would like some emotional support, you can, you can request this from your GP. So sometimes, you know, some, when you're trying to deal with other people's problems, especially if it's someone very close to you, you can end up getting really stressed yourself. So yes. there is also support for families out there, isn't there, Hamira? Absolutely right. And, and I think um, there's a couple of things that uh, to try and bear in mind when you're trying to deal with that, whether you're a professional or whether you're a relative or a friend. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that um, somebody who's self-harming is already feeling very vulnerable mm -hmm. and they're already extremely sensitive. Yes. And so uh, you were talking about your friends tiptoeing around you yeah. and trying not to get you upset. Um, honesty in the conversation is really important, right? Really trying to be um, as helpful as possible, but being honest as well. But I think making sure that your, whatever's going on in your conversation doesn't lead to guilt. I, right. you know, by sharing you're making somebody else feel bad mm -hmm. or you're making them angry. Shame that it's something strange and weird and it makes you different and how can you do this and make people that person feel that they're disappointing you in some way and then the mm. final piece is i think the the real blocker for somebody who's self-harming from from getting help is fear and the fear is fear of uh, seeming mad or manipulative or that doctors and psychiatrists and um, social workers will get involved. Yeah. Um, fear that um, it's, uh, you're, you'll have to talk about everything in your life and that's the only way to get to the bottom of it when actually there's things that at the moment you don't feel those mm. secrets that mm. you're willing, you don't actually want to deal with. Um, so I think making sure that you don't get into that side of yeah. things, that okay. you you are aware of the fact that actually fear can stop the person from okay. actually saying everything they need to say. Well, it's got some don'ts here as well. I think mm -hmm. you actually covered some some things here. Well, the first don't that it says here is try not to be their therapist. You have enough to deal with. So leave that to the professionals because mm -hmm. they, they do know what they're doing. Um, and this is an important one. Ex don't expect them to stop overnight. It's difficult and takes time. Now, I remember when I told my parents I was depressed, 
Um, you know, they, I had some counselling and then all the time they were like, are you okay now? Are you okay now? And they mm. kept sort of asking me and it was like, no, I'm not okay. I don't want to talk about it. Mm. And it's like, I felt pressure because they kept asking me. And in the end, I lied to them and said, well, actually, I'm okay now. When I wasn't, I was still yeah. having the panic attacks and everything. But I just said that because I, I didn't want them to ask anymore. So you need to be patient and not sort of badger the person because sometimes it makes them close up even more. I don't know if, if you had that experience. No, yeah, or, I did. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's not I think not easy. remembering that it's a coping mechanism and that it's a way of that person coping. Yeah. It might not seem to you a very healthy way of doing it, but it still is a coping yeah. mechanism. Yeah. Is important to remember. And I think the second piece is, let's remember also it becomes a habit. Mm. So it's a tough habit to break because yeah. it has its own reward associated with it. It can make you feel good. It is your very own thing to do. You've mm -hmm. done it before and it's, it's made you feel better. So it starts to be reinforcing in and of, its, of itself. Yeah. So remembering that actually it takes time for a habit to break, that sometimes you can lapse into yeah. bad habits mm -hmm. when things aren't mm -hmm. working out. That's why patterns and thinking about when your life is, when, what are the red flag situations? Mm -hmm. When are you entering a vulnerable period of your life? When are things getting on top of you? And anticipating that and dealing with it up front is probably the best way okay. to go about it. Good points. All right, so we've got a minute left. So let me try, let's just quickly read these last two and wrap up the show. So don't get angry. This will make them feel worse. It's obvious. Don't get angry with them. Uh, talk calmly about the effect it has on you in a way that shows how much you care for them. Um, don't struggle with them when they're about to self-harm. It says here it's best to walk away and to suggest they come and talk about it rather than do it. I think we need to do another show on this, guys, because there's just so much to talk about, isn't there? So we will do another show. And don't also make them promise not to do it again mm. or make your involvement conditional on them stopping. So they're already feeling bad about it. So if you're like, oh, please promise me you're not going to do it again. And you, you make them feel worse because it's like you're putting Definitely. so much pressure on them. That's not going to help. So, you know, if you, like, like you were saying earlier, if you don't feel that you can cope with it, talk to someone that can and that can actually help. And, you know, if, if, if professionals aren't involved yet and that maybe the person's just told you that you're fa the family, you need to, to seek professional help, if, you know, if your support isn't enough. So always remember that. But the, the main thing I want to, to get across, Charlotte, thank you so much. You did brilliantly. Really, really well. Well done. Thank you, Hamira. But the main thing that we wanted to get across in this show is that you're not alone. Okay, there is help for you. When you're ready, please do speak to someone. Like we said, it doesn't have to be anyone very close to you, but at least to, to, to get that conversation going. And there is life after self-harming, definitely. We didn't get to talk about everything Charlotte did yeah, about your, your boy and everything. Is, yeah. But there is definitely help out there. And I promise we will do another show on this very soon. So I hope that's helped. If you want any information about the programme today, you can visit the website, chrissybshow.tv. We'll also have Hamira's details on there if you need more information too. And if you'd like to speak to me personally, you can do so on chris at chrissybshow.tv. Bye-bye for now.